Well, you know, Jim, it is my show, and I have to say it's becoming quite intimidating every week before we prepare for my show or your show. It's just this nonstop news, just more <laughs> and more stuff. And this is two shows in a row where you and I spoke somewhat early in the day about the next day's recording. We said, yeah, Triple H, the big story, we'll talk all about it. And before you know it, before the end of the day, He's once not. again, <laughs> Vince McMahon takes back the headlines. Why don't we start there? Another report, and it was kind of a day of news from WWE. It was revealed in their filings earlier in the day about where exactly the money came from so far that we know of to pay off the women who had claims against Vince McMahon. We also found out that Triple H was going to be put in charge of all creative, but let's talk about Vince McMahon here. And Jim, I have an article, I think you have seen it too, the Wall Street Journal who has been on top of everything. The most important thing here in the headline, U.S. investigations hastened McMahon retirement from WWE, sources say, media company to revise financial statements to reflect hush money payments. Oh boy. Anytime hush, the word hush is in a headline. Um, so Brian, I'm just, as everybody knows, I'm just a simple small town bird lawyer. I don't know nothing about this big city uppity finance type of stuff. But remember when I was just scoffing at you just days ago saying, well, wait a minute, there's no criminal. He hasn't been accused of anything criminal. It, it's it's all uh, uh, civil liability, if any, that he would have, or just impropriety in business, but he's not actually might go to jail or anything. Well, son of a gun, wouldn't you know who won the pony? Explain to me now. I believe I grip this with, as I said, my mere token layman's understanding. But if the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, are now investigating Mr. McMahon slash the WWE, and the WWE has come out and admitted that they are revising their financial statements, then that is, as they say, incontrovertible evidence that Vince did not use at least all wholly, maybe in part, but not wholly, his own money to make these now 14 point something million dollars they're reporting in payments. The WWE wouldn't be revising their financial reports for several years recently to reflect this. And they wouldn't have said, the quote was, Vince McMahon either has paid or will pay all of that the hush money payments in question. This means he might have done something crooked that could be prosecuted in a criminal court. Am I correct? Well, the Wall Street Journal said the SEC. They also said federal prosecutors. Oh, well, the federal prosecutors don't mess around with uh, civil litigation, do they? And the other thing, and I want to point this out, we don't know what else is going to come out because whatever, is there a fucking motor outside? What the fuck is what? that? <laughs> what? All of a sudden I hear buzzing outside. All right, it's gone. That's, that's, that's the drone from Stamford keeping an eye on you. You've been calling this shit. Are you the fucking stooge? Did you drop a dime on Vince? That's not how I do things, but we'll talk a little bit later about who could be the stooge. But what I was going to say is we don't know what's going to come out. Real Sports is still looking into him. The Wall Street Journal. Right now, we're just focused on the payments. Not what the payments were covering up. It takes one DA who wants some press to go after Vince for anything that's illegal. And that could be trouble, too. Right now, we're just focused on the financial end of it. And these misappropriating company funds has or will pay back how much has he paid back? Yeah, and how, well paid back. Uh, and actually, it wasn't worded paid back. It was either has paid or will pay those payments. Oh, no, here it is so, in the article. WWE has said Mr. McMahon has or will pay, and that's the quote, all the expenses personally. So how many has he paid is the question. How many will he pay now that they caught him? <laughs> Why do that? Again, it. it I'm telling you the similarities. 
between Vince and Trump are incredible, as that if Vince is intelligent and articulate. But remember, they caught Trump not paying the fucking charity payments he said he was going to make. Now Vince is doing it with the, the, the company money on hush payments, hush money. But it, it how did I, that's again? I said before I was surprised at this coming out. Not that maybe not that Vince would do these things, but that he would do them in the company and potentially at the advanced age he was doing them at. But now I'm especially because somebody did the math. I, I saw it on the internet and said for Vince's net worth, him paying, it was $12 million at that time, him paying $12 million to various people is the equivalent of somebody whose net worth is between a million and two million paying them $750. Here. It's ridiculous money, but it, it to Vince, what the fuck, right? So why would he risk doing this and use company money instead of here, here's a check. Boom. I completely agree with you, but I just want to point out, we don't know one way or another if how much Vince has available to him. We don't know how much is liquid. We don't know how much is in stock and how much he actually has in cash at hand. Apparently he's got access to a lot of liquid. As Shivani or Arn Anderson said about Shivani that time, you got enough come in you to shampoo a buffalo. I don't think Vince would have a problem getting a hold of 10 or $12 million at this point in his life if he needed it. And he didn't need it all at one time. They, these were these were spread out payments in one case, and whoever got the $7.5 million, that was only four years ago for an incident that happened multiple years before that. It's not like that Vince had more money four years ago than he did whenever he did what he did with whoever he did it with. The problem is Vince ran that company. He ran the creative side the same way he ran the business side, which is this is all for me. This yeah. is my piggy bank. This is entertainment for me. The audience will like it because I tell them to like it because I like it. This is all about him. And this is all about the, despite it being a public company. This is one of the reasons I never believed in the stock and I would never buy it because I knew this is how they run it. I didn't know about payments like this, but it was his personal money in his eyes. It's his company. And now he's going to reimburse the company for all these payments to the women. We still don't know what any of these women got paid not to talk about. Well, and it, this is not unusual. Again, remember how many years have I been saying, how many years ago did they go public? That's how many years I've been saying this. A professional wrestling business is not supposed to be regulated and has never have been regulated. And it's, it would be chaos if it was regulated and this kind of behavior, blah, blah, blah. It's say, remember when Jim Barnett, all the promotions that he ran and operated, he can say, I'm not saying he messed around with any of the secretaries. I'm saying that the guy in charge considers that his, his personal fiefdom. And when Barnett was the guy that came up with all the the contacts and all the investors and all the sponsors and had all the knowledge and the ability to set all this stuff up. He treated it sometimes like his own personal piggy bank. And that's when he went to Hong Kong to get new suits made or whatever. And Ole Anderson just fucking, I don't know if he had to kick the door in, but he went in against somebody's will in the office and got into Barnett's desk and looked at the books and saw that he was, taking money out and that's how he turned the other uh owners investors against barnett but as barnett countered with nobody ever argued when i found the money to put in the fucking thing they just argued when i took some of it out and just to sum this up for history's sake got pushed into the arms of vince mcmahon jr who was about to go national and needed a jim barnett it worked yes. out perfectly <laughs> The most vindictive, powerful man in the wrestling business got run off by Ole Anderson straight into the waiting arms of the WWF. And that may have been the move, actually, in hindsight, that that won the war for Vince. Eventually, Crockett came in like the volunteers from Tennessee at the Alamo, but too late. And there you go. Never crossed Jim Barnett. But apparently somebody has crossed Vince McMahon. 
because this, again, a lot of, somebody knows a lot about some shit that a lot of people didn't know about before, and now people are finding out about. So what is this, a, 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 a whodunit? The, the world's greatest historical wrestling whodunit. Who turned in Vince? Who dropped the dime on, on the chairman? It's really interesting, too, if you think about pretty much the last year, what we know and what we don't know. What was it, September, that Triple H all of a sudden has a cardiac event, and he's out of the picture completely. And then, maybe I'm forgetting an event or two, but in January, there's some sort of meltdown at the Royal Rumble where Vince bans Shane McMahon from WWE. Well, yeah, Shane was trying to, um, you know, shine in the Royal Rumble match to the detriment of a lot of other people, and and we covered that at the time. Shane's not a prick. He just believed that he was helping, but it stirred everybody up, and, and Vince unbooked him. He didn't fire him because it's like this is not a job that Shane was depending on, but he just unbooked him. Then at some point between the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania, I guess that's the period of time we would think that the board of directors initiated this investigation. So Vince and Stephanie and everyone knew about it. And then Vince headlined WrestleMania. It was supposed to be, the word got out, it was him against McAfee. Then they changed it to McAfee versus Theory. It became McAfee versus McMahon, which became Vince versus Austin. Then we found out Stephanie was leaving the company to spend more time at home with her family. <laughs> Who all work in the company, so she'd actually be the only one home. Then all of a sudden it's announced that Stephanie's returning, and then these Vince McMahon stories come out. A few appearances on TV, almost like he's trying to hold on. In terms of whodunit, it's very hard to say. I mean, everyone's pointing fingers at everyone else. We don't know who's still helping Vince. We don't know if Vince is trying to hold on to control right now from the outside. Well, uh, well, uh, think about this. We were looking at it one way, and I was, okay, what has really changed? Vince retired, so that way the heat is off. He's not involved officially, but his daughter, who he trained and brought up, uh, mentored, is the uh, chairwoman, or the charwoman. That did get over in, in jolly old England, by the way. Over in Britain, they loved it. Cheers, folks. She's the chairwoman and co-CEO. His son-in-law is now not only the head of talent relations, but the head of creative, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. So really, I was saying nothing has changed in, unless they wanted to drastically depart from Vince's vision and not only that, but sell him on why they're doing it so they didn't get shit from the, from the old man. But another way to look at this is, was the call coming from inside the house? Maybe at Triple H? Nobody's saying it was a work, that he had a heart incident. But when that happened, they used that as an opportunity for Vince to get his fucking fingers in NXT, and he and Bruce went down and gobbledygookered it up, where now it's just abysmal. And anybody thinks that those people, whether they get them ready for the main roster, what Vince thought was main roster ready, uh, anybody thinks any of those people are going to be able to draw money with those, with that training and that experience and being used like that, bleh. then um, ratings have contained the drama with Shane, and then everybody's complaining about Vince, the old man, he's lost it. A lot of the talent was grumbling. We have to please the old guy. Um, and I mean, you know, there's there's brilliant people that are 90 years old, but Vince, as we've talked about, didn't seem to have the same knack for spotting a star. I'm wondering, this is a long-winded way to beat around the bush and go to this, but I'm wondering... <laughs> If did Stephanie and Triple H go, you know what? Fuck. He's going to, this is going to be, it's not going to be something we can come back from if we lose too much more of our popularity with these renegotiations of the TV contract looming in a year and a half, two years, whatever case. If Pop won't take our suggestions and or insinuations 
to heart at this point, should maybe Pop just go to the home and we can get this thing ready where old Nick Khan over here can sell it to Disney for 10 billion fucking dollars. Or Fox. Or Fox or whatever. Do you think, could the call have come from inside the house? Well, again, we did this the other day on the show. I have here the board of directors of WWE, Stephanie McMahon, Paul Levesque, Nick Khan. Again, Nick Khan, their longtime agent. A successful agent in Hollywood, not just their agent, a big agent. Yeah. They brought him in-house for a reason. We all thought the reason was to sell. Again, we don't know. If Vince McMahon was standing in everyone's way for creative reasons, we don't know what other things were happening in the business side. Maybe Daddy said don't sell. We don't know. It certainly seemed like in other areas he was trying as hard as he could to hold on. Certainly surrounding himself with, you know, stooges, the likes of which we haven't seen since Nixon. <laughs> and again, the other people on hey, the... wait a minute. Wait a minute. Does that make... If Laurinaitis is Spiro Agnew... Does that mean who who would Bruce be then? Or maybe could Bruce be old Spiro? Bruce is like Liddy, I think, more than... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> despite, you know, having hair and no, no mustache. No, 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 since he's always smiling, he could be G. Gordon Giddy. All right, you nattering nabob of negativity. Oh, boy, for the political junkies from 50 years ago, that one was hilarious. Continue with your thought. But also on the board, Steve Coonan from the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena. Ignance Lehud. From um, something. Erica Nardini <laughs> from Barstool Stort Sports. Steve. Barstool Sports? I can't read. Steve Pomone from Versus. Manjeet Singh from uh, formerly of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Jeffrey R. Speed. One of the better names on here. For Six Flag. Oh, I like Manjeet Singh, though. That's pretty awesome. And Alan Wexler. No relation to Jerry Wexler. From General Motors. So the idea is... Did one of them have reason to try to push Vince out, maybe trying to edge towards a sale? Or did one of the family have reason to push Vince out? This is our chance to take over the company. Or well, did Nick Khan push Vince out? Because this is my chance to not have to deal with Vince anymore. I can manage Stephanie. We don't know. Well, of course, now some of the people out there are astutely going, but wait a minute, you guys are missing part of the story. One of the, the, st the official story... And this is a fluid situation. But the official story uh, was that a, a friend of the, the spurned paramour from the condo in Stamford had emailed a member of the board of directors. Now, if that's true, obviously, she's not going to email Stephanie or anybody in the family. We don't know it that. Be, don't assume that. Well, one would think... One would say, I know when you assume, you make an ass of you and me. Right, and, she, and I hate to put it so uh, crudely, but if she's sleeping with Vince, and she was for a few years at least, we don't know what Vince is saying to her about what he thinks of his family. We don't know what really goes on. So don't assume she didn't, because it could have been someone in the family, and they could have hit it from Vince by just saying it was a member of the board. Boy, if Vince's condo was wired for sound as part of the security system, but now we, I wonder if we could subpoena those records, but... Well, but still, the point is, one of the members of the board of directors was alerted to this somehow. And, you know, it would seem to be an easily disprovable story with this investigation they're doing if it wasn't a friend of the, the person involved. But I'm just wondering uh, how they found a, a friendly member, or a not a friendly member, but a non-friendly member of the board, and how they knew for sure. Okay, think about this. If you're the friend of some illegal paralegal, the telltale tart, and you know this story, and you want, wouldn't you probably, unless you had inside information, which she did, wouldn't you know that, or think that most of the important people in the company would already know about this? And how would you know which member of the board of directors would take this information and be friendly to your side of it rather than going, ah, oh, Vince, this fucking over here, she's, oh, she's going to cause trouble. Now, the bigger story is how did you know which member of the board of directors would give this to the Wall Street Journal? Well, and that's another one. 
Because then who did that? Who done that? Was it the board of directors person or was it the friend? Was it the friend trying to make sure that people knew that the board of directors knew about this? No, it was, I believe the Wall Street Journal's original article stated it came from a source with knowledge on the board of directors. Well, there you go then. See, it's a carefully orchestrated plan. And it all, it, it revolved around Vince McMahon's well-known predilection for doing whatever the fuck he wants to do. And they just had to sit back and, but I can't believe again that he would, I mean, he won the first round with the federal government 30 years ago, which is amazing enough. When you come off scot-free from a federal prosecution, you're doing something. And 30 years later, just for 12 or $14 million so far that we know of, he's not going to just write him a check out of his own checking account. He's going to have the WWE pay for it and not report it on their financials when he is the one who enabled them to become a publicly traded company. Even for Vince, that's, it's not, that's not even balls. That's just a slip up in paperwork and doing things right. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to do shit under the table, you ought to know how far you need to go to get under the table. It was arrogance is what it was, but the big question is, do you think Jerry McDivitt will ever get to retire? No, poor fella. He's, uh, I, we thought Vince was never going to be the one to retire. Now Vince is retired and Jerry McDivitt has to work for the next five years to get Vince out of all the shit that he just got himself in. Do you think Vince stays in Connecticut or does he go to Florida? Ooh. You know, I'm not sure that Vince McMahon at least, the, again, the Vince that I knew could stay away from being in or around New York City for long, extended periods of time. Just because of the That's, barber? No, he just, every time you mention New York or every time he's there, on the way to the garden in the limo, you just seem perk up a little more. He loves New York. He told me, because it was just me and him one time from a shotgun Saturday night the shoot where, God damn it, was that where I picked up the midget Vader from the bus station that we made him ride from Mexico because I was cheap and he couldn't <laughs> get to the urinal or whatever. Vince had all these sight <laughs> gags. No, said, here's the thing. We have no permit to shoot. It's a guy with a camera, a guy with a boom mic, me dressed in my fucking multicolored manager outfit with a tennis racket, and a goddamn midget dressed like Vader. And the Vince has concocted the idea that I've brought the mini Vader in, but I'm so cheap, I made him ride a bus all the way from Mexico. And even though, yes, I know they do have bathrooms on buses, Vince thought it'd be another great sight gag, visual, if when the I meet mini Vader coming off the bus, he's holding his knees together and he's jumping up and down and he's got to take a piss. He's about to piss himself because he couldn't piss all the way from Mexico. So I take him in the, what is it? The port authority there? Is that where the buses and everything yeah, come in? One of the most disgusting places on the planet. That's yeah, it. And, and, and we're, and, and look at us and there's Vince McMahon producing this. So it, we're a site, even in New York, and we go in the men's room and there's people looking at us. And the deal is I'm supposed to have to Mini Vader can't piss in the urinal because he's too short and he can't get up <laughs> the urinal. So I'm having to try to get under his arms. Up, but because I'm not strong enough to pick up this fucking lead ass fat midget, you know, he's, he can't. And, but the thing is we go in there and the, the urinals are like eight inches off the ground. They're all the way down. The visual, the sight gag that Vince has come up with won't work. He said, do it anyway. So there, while legitimate travelers are <laughs> pissing in what I assume to be the country's biggest fucking bus station, I've got this Mexican midget speaking in Spanish. Hola, hola, mira, Dressed like Vader, complete with the mask, under the arms, trying to pick him up so that he can fake piss into a fucking urinal that's already on the ground to begin with. And they, they think I'm shaking him for change or something. And, and, and there's a camera shooting, and then we just left. I slunk out. That's a place I slunk out of. And you think this is an example of Vince's love of New York City? 
But but the, the oh where I was going was so we're in the limo on the way over to the shotgun taping just me and Vince after that and I'm just looking out the window he said you don't like the city do you I said it just Vince it's so crowded it's the traffic it's the people it's the crowd it's the you know I can't you can't get anywhere it's from one place to another it's chaos he's ah it's the greatest city in the world. You can get something to eat anytime. It, it, nothing ever closes. The wonderful, the tourist attractions. See, he looks at the attractions that he never goes to as a, signif a signification that the city is great. And I look at all those attractions that I would actually like to see if it wasn't an hour and a half or two hours to go three miles in between each one. So we just had different viewpoints on New York. I don't believe he would leave the New York area full time for long periods of time. Do you think Vince will hire Bruce Pritchard, John Laurinaitis, or Kevin Dunn with a personal services contract? Boy, I tell you what, that's a goddamn, and they could go to Florida and remake the famous Marx Brothers classic, The Coconuts. But Kevin Dunn, Bruce Pritchard, John Laurinaitis, and Vince McMahon would, could be the new Marx Brothers. I, I, I have a feeling all of the folks that you mentioned besides Vince are going to are going to be retiring at some point in the near future from at least the WWE. I don't know about all of well Kevin Dunn will never work in an, another wrestling promotion and I would imagine John Laurinaitis would not either. Bruce would uh, because he he does have affection for the business w might very well do something else somewhere else at some point in time. Anyone that hires him, that's a mistake. Don't do Well, that. no, now you can't say anybody. I'll tell you what, Bruce has spent a lot of time in, in Texas. I bet you he can do heck of a drywall job for you. So. I don't know about that, but you're talking about people that have retired and everyone's talking about Vince. Let's just put a couple things to bed before we move on with Vince, because believe it or not, we have received some feedback from listeners. No, this is not an angle, and no, Vince will not be appearing on AEW Dynamite. Do you agree? <laughs> I, I can even believe somebody not, you know, really reading closely and just seeing a tweet or something and think, okay, they're working, and Vin, but I can't. Imagine anybody that's not in a medically induced coma imagining Vince McMahon would show up on All Elite Wrestling. That's not ever going to happen in this universe or probably any alternate universe. Do you think Vince could do better ratings on Court TV than WWE can do on USA Network? I think Vince on Court TV can beat AEW. I'm not sure if they, and they might challenge Raw. I'm not sure they could top SmackDown on Fox just because, well, you know, it's still broadcast. Well, there it is, an honest and fair assessment. But, Jim, let me ask you about someone who's not retiring, someone who has returned. We heard a few weeks ago that Paul Levesque showed up in NXT and said, I'm back. And then we didn't know what the hell that meant. <laughs> now we have found out WWE has released an official statement from Stanford, Connecticut, July 22nd, 2022. WWE today announced that effective immediately, and actually this is the previous one, this is when they announced that he was head of talent relations. They just announced that a few days ago. and then. They announced, and I don't have the official statement here. I thought I did. But it's my, it, was, it was Friday he was back as head of uh, talent relations, and Monday, he got, it was a quick promotion. took 72 hours. He also is head of creative. He is now also head of creative. So what are your thoughts on the idea? We all thought, at least temporarily, that Bruce would be the head of creative because that was kind of the role he had for Vince. Triple H head of creative. Triple H head of talent relations. Stephanie McMahon co-CEO and chairwoman. What are your thoughts on what all this means with Triple H? Well, first off, obviously, Triple H has a, a heart condition. He had announced his retirement from the ring ever. He's got a pacemaker or a defibrillator. I sound like fucking Costanza's dad trying to say Del Boca Vista. Um, whatever he's got in his heart, he doesn't need to take over that stressful a job for a long period of time, but I'm sure he's doing it for at least one of, if not both of two reasons. Number one, the team is in need. The company is in 
not trouble as a company, but the company is has troubles and needs somebody to be in those positions. I don't think I would hope that he's not looking at doing all both of those things and whatever else he's going to be doing because you know he's going to be in everything for the next ten years. I hope this is not a long term thing. I'm thinking what they're doing is we're stepping in now. We're going to establish some type of order and level-headedness around here. We're going to hopefully get things moving in an even better direction than they were, and they are either getting the company, the ship righted and sailing steadily, and the stock is already up 10% since the Vince News and all this other stuff, almost 10 and then they can let Nick Khan work his magic and everybody prospers. And at the same time, Stephanie will have established herself as the person probably to be one of the chief executives, if not the chief executive, under new ownership because she's one with all the experience. And Triple H then can probably have a better idea of who he can appoint to help him, assist him, take over one of those positions under him, whatever the case may be. To where he doesn't have to work so goddamn hard. But it makes sense. And I would say Triple H great for both those jobs forevermore if it wasn't for the, you know, the fact he's got a heart condition. You don't want, you know, suicide for fuck's sake. But that is a incredibly, both those positions are very stressful. But it makes perfect sense from a wrestling standpoint for a wrestling company. Because if you combine the jobs of head of creative and head of talent relations, what you get is the old job of Booker, right? Because a Booker's job, and we've talked about it, but I'll summarize it, that the promoter may have owned the company. And the promoter ultimately was on the hook financially and responsible for, uh, you know, all the, the arena costs and paying the talent and advertising and television and getting all those things, getting the television, getting the arena dates. He ran the company and he made the most money when it was profitable, but the second most important person in any wrestling territory was the booker. Generally, but not always, it was one of the boys. Almost always, the booker had been one of the boys or in some way a participant referee, manager, whatever. The the booker was also, if he was wrestling, probably a main event wrestler and also being paid as the booker. So it was definitely the second highest paying gig you could have besides actually owning the company. But the booker was responsible for deciding what talent to use and what not. So it's the same thing as talent relations. They... They hire and they fire. They sign the contracts. There was no contracts back in the Booker days. The Booker would call you up and say, hey, can you start in two weeks? Here's your start date. And the Booker would tell you two weeks ahead of time, here's your finish date, or longer if you were a main event star. But it's still the same thing. They decided which talent to bring in based on who they liked, who they thought could draw money, who they wanted to push. The promoter always got to keep certain homesteaders, people that were important to the territory that the booker may not have normally employed, which sometimes led to some inner office strife and definitely gave the promoter a, a hotline to stooge on the booker if he did anything wrong. But the, the booker, besides bringing in the talent and or letting go the talent and dealing with all the talent's problems, did they do something? Did they get arrested? Is somebody hurt? Somebody got an issue with somebody else in the locker room we need to straighten out. That's all talent relations. And head of creative, the booker also formatted every television show, decided the lineup for every house show, decided who went over in those matches and came up with the finishes. And usually, especially in a territory of any size, the booker would have one assistant. Dusty had J.J. Dillon. Dusty had Kevin Sullivan in Florida. Various people at various times had various assistants. But that was pretty much it. 
There wasn't a crew of writers. There wasn't a talent relations staff. The booker was the guy. That's why that sometimes if a promoter got sideways with a booker and the booker pulled out, the promoter would suddenly lose half his talent roster overnight because in a lot of cases, the talent was more beholden to the booker than they were that promoter. That one promoter, if they weren't liking where they were working anyway, they didn't care if they came back, but that guy booking may have a job in five different territories over the next 15 years. So talent relations and creative, as they call it now, go hand in hand if you're talking about a wrestling company. The problem has become that this one has gotten so large and they do so much television, they do so much programming, so many various shows that even though it's best for wrestling, it's the most cohesive, logical, sensible, reasonable, easy to understand product under one fucking guy. One guy can't do all this. I mean, and I'm talking about the booker, even he oversaw live event promos every week. Anytime a wrestler was on camera or in an arena in front of fans, the booker had facilitated that creative, whatever it was. And it's just not possible now for one person, but the smallest staff you can have, the better off, because elsewise you've got 18 people in the kitchen, everybody's cooking, nobody's eating, and it's a Chinese fire drill. What do you think it says about the idea that the head of create the booker, let's just say that to sum up both roles like you did, is married to the person who's the promoter? Or co well, you know, and that probably isn't, I'm, hold on. Well, I guess that's a first in wrestling history. I was thinking Ann Gunkel wasn't married at the time that uh, she was a promoter, so her husband couldn't have been the booker. And it would have been difficult um, for any other booker and promoter combo in history to be married, at least legally, before, what, 2016? I can't think of one. So they're a first, but again, who else is going to... Nick Khan is a better business person than Stephanie McMahon would ever be, and that's not even a knock on Stephanie. It's just, my God, here's this, Nick Khan's been in Hollywood for however many years and has done all this, you know, these deals already and is a big-time player in the business world, and it's Stephanie. But by the same token, Nick Khan is not going to soon catch up to Stephanie in terms of knowledge Maybe not about wrestling history or the biography of every great, you know, star of the 50s, but the product knowledge that she has from being there for now 20 something years and talking to her husband every night and, and learning from her dad over the period of time. She's not the same, you know, 21 year old girl fresh out of college that she was when she showed up in 99. So, She's got more knowledge that pertains to the WWE business than Nick Khan does or will be able to grasp in just through experience anytime in the near future. So, you know, again, who at this point, it's like the talent roster. They're down to who the fuck are we going to get to put on this thing? Who's qualified? Who's capable? The amount of people who can do any job in professional wrestling, well with experience and knowledge has never been lower just by attrition and because nobody either can get the experience, does have the knowledge, is training, or is, is you know, is working at a business of any kind of level whatsoever anymore. So if they don't like Stephanie and Triple H, good luck. Who the fuck else are you going to get? What do you think? And I know you've had problems with Triple H in the past, but it's been a long time ago. We've seen some of his vision in NXT. We think we have an idea of a different direction. Do you think there will be big differences? And do you think, I mean, it's always been Vince McMahon's vision. It's going to be weird all of a sudden if all of a sudden these shows have someone else's vision there. Well, here's the thing. I think it's going to be more adult, and I'm not talking about adult you know, everybody cussing, I'm talking about 
a product aimed at somebody over the age of 12 mentally, which now it's not. Triple H was part of the whole, the click, the curtain call, blah, blah, blah. But look at him compared to, honestly, the rest of them. He never had a drug problem. He never had an alcohol problem. He never fucking refused to do a job. He never fucking no-showed or, or showed up in no condition to work. He's been, no pun intended, a student of the game. I'm sure he studied himself in the mirror quite often also, but he's a student of the game. He idolized flair. He loved wrestling to get into it before he, you know, became involved with a billion-dollar company at a high level. What we have seen that we had reason to believe he was responsible for, NXT, even though he made the fatal mistake of pushing too many of the indie darlings that Vince would never go for visually on site. And that's what led to Vince overreacting and gutting the whole thing. He, it was more a wrestling centric product and some of the logic, uh, the loopholes in the logic that you see on the other programs was closed up and it just wasn't as silly and wasn't as pasteurized and homogenized and, sanitized and you know so i think he's probably also triple h is smart enough to realize following the pattern you've got to make new stars you got to push new talent um and also there's something to be said for aew letting the guys who can do more of their own promos and more of their own not matches themselves, but have more of themselves in what they're doing and a little more freedom. They are, And also Triple H should be smart enough to see and differentiate the guys that shouldn't be given freedom because he'll know which ones are the knuckleheads. I just, I think they're, because he's been, he's been one of the boys, even though it's been a very long time. And he knows the frustration when he sees especially somebody that he thinks could be a personality on their own, but they're being, you know, forced to do what Vince, like when we heard about, there's more news on, on Max Dupree. We might talk about that on another clip, but the point is that was a Vince thing. Uh, Vince was personally producing that awful rotten segment where poor Eli Drake, LA Knight had to go out there and talk like Bronson Pinchot in Beverly Hills Cop, oh, Serge. And it wasn't him, and it was cringy and embarrassing for the talent. And now they fired him because he probably spoke up about it. But that was Vince doing Did they that fire personally. Him? Well, I didn't say. They they took him out of his own model management thing. Where else, What else is he going to do? I don't know. I don't know if they fired him from the whole company, but they took him out of the gimmick that they changed his previous gimmick to put him into to make because he, I guess went to him and said in some varying degrees of a nice way, what the fuck are you making me do? Cause it was Vince's idea and it was horrible and it would have gobbledygookered and red roostered this guy if it had gone any further, but nevertheless, I don't think triple H will do that to talent. I think he, it, and let's face it. If he, tolerated Johnny Gargano's blandness for all that time because the NXT fans liked him, then he's going to give people a chance to do what they can do rather than trying to reinvent them completely and running them off. So, again, I don't see how any of that's going to be... I don't think that it's suddenly going to become, you know, Mid-South Wrestling overnight and we're going to see you know, blood and broken ribs and black eyes and guys looking like the aftermath of a UFC fight in the octagon. That's too, might be too much to hope for, but we will see probably a little bit more adult in terms of just being serious and just speaking to a person over the age of 18 and possibly something that's a little less insulting to the traditional wrestling fan, you know, with Triple H, how can a guy that, you know, stole one of Harley Race's trademark bumps not respect the traditional aspect of wrestling? I know he knows it's going to be entertainment and 
you know, they're a multi-media conglomerate worldwide company and you can't just, you know, go out there and, and try to get people climbing over the fucking rail. They're so mad. But I th it, it'll probably be eventually closer to wrestling than what we've been seeing. And maybe uh, the individual talents will get more of a chance to show whether they can get over or not. Because this is the guy that's the talking head on the Rivals episode, you know, that uh, that's talking about how Austin and Rock were so real, which is why it registered. What do you think he's going to do with all the writers? Well, I don't, you know, disemboweling, uh, beheading, drawn and quartering. Tar and feathering. There's a that's variety. Ridiculous. You know what? You're being ridiculous. The guy's known no, for using no. a sledgehammer. Okay, well that's true. He, so he can play whack-a-mole with the writer. No, I mean again, I know they have to have a staff of writers now because they have so much content and the, and and it, a lot of writing of wrestling is also keeping track of what other shows are doing or what other footage is going out in different you know, uh, Twitter or the website or what it just, and all this international content they do, it's insane. But I think that hopefully he will try to impress on the writers. Okay. I've seen what y'all were doing for Vince. Some of it I was impressed by and some of it left me cold, but I know that he can be uh, somewhat intimidating, overwhelming presence. So this is what we want to do. Let's start coming up with things in this direction, and I'll give you a chance to shine on your own for my purposes. But then maybe he can weed out a few people who are just there to provide the, you know, slapstick comedy and get a few more wrestling minds involved in what's going on. Possibly younger ones than Michael Hayes, who is pretty much my age and... You know, I know that... Um, He's been there a long time. Forget about even age. I well, mean, you talk at, about at, a wrestler at, being on a roster a long time. How many bookers, how many, I guess, writers in this case, work for a company for 25 years? Well, that's the thing I've, I was about to say. I know I've said that nobody executive produces television for 40 years for the same company or program or whatever like Kevin Dunn has. Well, nobody ever, including me or no, what I've never wanted to, is on a creative fucking team for 20 fucking years. And I'm not saying fire Michael. If you want to, you can. I'm not advocating for him either. I'm just saying just get some new fucking heads, younger, serious-minded wrestling heads. MJF, anyone. But younger, serious-minded wrestling heads that have some experience but are still hopefully capable of coming up with a new thought that doesn't require being passed by Vince. And you might have something underneath Triple H who's keeping track of all of them and not letting them go too far with Hollywood horse shit. Do you think Triple H will be getting a good night's sleep? Well, only, only if he listens to our program and is hipped, clued in to the fact that Beam is still around, folks. We haven't talked about them in a few weeks, but our friends at Beam and their incredible sleep product, Dream Powder, are still right along ringside and ready for another big night of championship sleeping. And folks, you know, poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, lower productivity. You know, my sleeping hours have changed slightly since we've had uh, construction going on around the house and that may have led to some of my grumpiness this weekend when I went out in the garage with a baseball bat and began bashing shit so you don't want poor sleep if you sleep less than six to seven hours a night that's linked to re reduced white blood cell count and uh, folks I'll tell you if you don't have the white blood cells in with the red blood cells then your blood turns black did you know that, Brian? Completely black. If you don't have any white to balance out the blood to get to the red, which is in the middle of the spectrum, your blood is black. It scares the shit out of people if you have a nosebleed. You look like you're goddamn hemorrhaging from Ebola. So you want white blood cells. They're very good in protecting your body against illness and diseases and also keeping your blood red. And every American wants to be red-blooded.
Now, to get good sleep, you need the Dream Powder. It's the Beam's best-selling healthy hot cocoa, which contains natural sleep-promoting premium ingredients. They're triple lab-tested. And boy, I'll tell you what. I've seen some of this lab testing. They had to find three different labs that would test this stuff in the same day. They wanted to make sure it was fresh. And one of the labs had to move this giant pile of meth that they were testing for that, the FBI. Over that the is side. not true. That is not true. There is no well, it, meth, and there's no reason to discuss no. methamphetamines while discussing the wonders and the wonderful I didn't say bean I said powder. The lab. This was a big time crime lab. They don't use they, a crime lab for bean and powder. They, and they were also they were checking out three different corpses' DNA to well, see if saw, they could find Jimmy Hoffa. But they put that on hold, Ridiculous. and instead they analyzed the dream powder. That's no. why it's triple lab tested. It's got no THC in it if you're in one of those states. And folks, the best part, when it comes to the statistics, 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream, and 99% of people experience better sleep quality. 1% of people wind up in a state home, but overall odds no. are on your side by a vast majority folks this beam dream powder made from bolivian juju bees is the most incredible it's like drinking a cup of hot chocolate you just mix it up with the water or the milk and you stir and you enjoy it before bedtime if you want to go sleep if if you get pulled over on the side of the road by the police and you think you're going to jail for some type of possession or something you've ingested Go ahead and take a big cup of beam and you'll sleep the whole time you're in prison. Don't give this advice. What kind of advice is this to give in the middle of the spot? Hey, have you ever been awake when you were in jail? It's not pleasant. I haven't been in jail. I'm well, an upstanding God, member of society. Where have you been? You meet a, a better class of people in jail than you meet out on the streets these days. But uh, folks, I tell, once again, don't, don't be awake when you're in jail. Go to sleep, drink some beam and go to sleep. It passes, the time passes just like that. Except when you go to sleep, try to sleep on your back. Why don't you but speak to the everyday listener, the man who comes home from a hard day's work and he has his family there and he wants to watch his game or some shows and he wants yeah. to go to sleep and there's so much going on. That's the person who needs beam. Not the prisoners. Well, see, I was I was being the voice of the voiceless, speaking to the people who <laughs> who need to sleep through jail sentences. And, you know, depending on the length of your sentence, you might need to get extra beam. But nevertheless, if you don't love it, you can get your money back. I'm not talking about jail. I'm talking about beam. And now, for a limited time only, you can get the dream powder that produces this best-selling healthy hot cocoa that gives you the best night's sleep that you've ever had since the last time you were in a medically induced coma. All you got to do is go to Shop Beam. That's Shop. S-H-O-P, how many different ways can you do it? And beam, B-E-A-M, B-E-A-M. It's like you're going to be beaming. You're going to have such a grin on your face when you wake up after you drink the beam, they're going to have to wipe that off with a sandblaster. Shopbeam.com slash J-C-E. You use the code J-C-E at checkout. You get $20 off this amazing product. Shopbeam dot com slash jce use the code jce for twenty dollars off and may you have as sammy terry used to say on wttv4's creature features may you have many pleasant nightmares <laughs>